never been a time, uh, my book about the 1917 East St. Louis race riot, uh, had it start really in the early 90s when I was uh, working at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and I was uh, writing an obituary of Miles Davis, the great trumpet player, who was from East St. Louis, which is across a smaller city across the river from St. Louis. And uh, stories of the race riot had filled his ears as he was a child, he said. And uh, he uh, talked about how horrible it was to learn that white people had massacred black people in, in this small city in Illinois. And he thought that it affected him for the rest of his life. And that in fact, uh, it might well, the, the fact of the riot in his hometown might well have affected his attitude towards white people uh, until the day he died, uh, really. And, uh, and I thought, my gosh, uh, Miles Davis died, I was born, I'm sorry, in 1926. He was minus nine years old when the race riot occurred. And for something like that to have been so prevalent, so persistent in the stories that he heard as a child, it seemed to me a powerful uh, indication that a story needed to be told. And I asked around, and, and black people uh, in general who grew up here knew about the riot, but uh, their parents hadn't really discussed it, and their grandparents. White people, on the whole, didn't know about it at all. And yet, it was, uh, by the number, uh, the deadliest race riot in American history until the Rodney King riot of, uh, in Los Angeles. And I discovered that, uh, that congressional hearings had been held six months after the riot and that people who had participated in the riot, black and white, uh, businessmen, uh, a, a variety of people in East St. Louis had been interviewed by this congressional committee, this committee of five congressmen. And they had told the story of the riot in incredible narrative detail. And I thought, well, my God, this is a great head start. And so starting with that, uh, I, I tried interviewing people. This would have been in the late, uh, the, the late latter years of the, of the 20th century and in the, in the very beginning of the 21st century. Uh, people in their 90s, and, and I interviewed some people, and I discovered that their memories were not as good as I thought they might be. And it, not particularly their age, but the distance from the events. People tend to embellish their memories as they go along. And so I decided I'd go with the written record, and, and much of it was, was published. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about, the, uh, wrote about the East St. Louis race riot, covered it for the NAACP. Uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, the great uh, black uh, separationist leader, uh, had written about the riot. And it was front page of the, every paper in the country for a week or so. 1917 is not that long ago. The fact that uh, whites were massacring blacks in the streets of a, of a, of a middle-sized American city uh, is just horrific. In the, in the early years of World War I, America had just entered World War I. Uh, the factories across America geared up, and there were many jobs available. And blacks from the South, at, at the same time the boll weevil was destroying the cotton crop, and farm jobs were disappearing, and so blacks were moving in large numbers north to uh, industrial cities. And East St. Louis was uh, an industrial city, and uh, there were inevitable clashes between blacks and whites that took place over these jobs, and it just evolved into a riot that took place uh, in July of that year, July of 1917. The night of July 1st, uh, a, a Model T Ford, a black Model T Ford, drove through a black neighborhood, people shooting out of the windows. An hour later, a black Model T Ford moved through a black neighborhood with people shooting out of the windows. No one was killed, uh, but the third time the, a black Model T Ford went through a black neighborhood with people shooting out of the windows, blacks had assembled, young black men had assembled with guns, and they shot back, and two police detectives were killed. And that triggered the riot, and then all chaos broke out the next morning. It started out, uh, as riots often do, with, uh, uh, with, fist, with fist fights in the streets and so forth, but they quickly escalated. And one of the reasons they escalated was that there was a central mob of uh, men who probably had been in the bars drinking all night 
uh, which you could do in East St. Louis in those days. And, but, but soon there were atro terrible atrocities. Uh, black men were hung from telephone poles in downtown streets. Uh, one man's scalp was ripped loose. Uh, a mother and her baby were shot as they were trying to escape from a burning building. Much of the downtown area was burned down. Uh, and as I, as I believe I said, 48, if I didn't, 48 people were killed, 39 of them black and at least three of the white people that were killed were killed accidentally by other white people. And uh, it was, it, finally the National Guard came in and, and uh, restored peace, but uh, uh, by that time the city, much of the city was just devastated. The, uh, the mayor instructed, uh, did not want a record of this, and did not want East St. Louis to be known as the place of this terrible riot. And the mayor instructed the police to confiscate cameras and destroy film. And so very few pho photographs actually emerged from the riot. And some of those that did, in fact, all of those that did, as far as I was able to determine, were thrown away uh, when one of the newspapers uh, cleaned out its reference library in the 20s. So the, the, uh, the imagery, uh, it comes mainly from uh, from drawings in newspapers, which there were, there were several of those. I suppose the thing I learned that, was, that stuck with me most strongly in writing the book was the fact that uh, the Civil Rights Movement did not begin in the 1950s with the uh, with decision in the Topeka uh, school system uh, case, that, that uh, it began the day after slavery ended and persists until this day. And that in 19, in, in, in the period of World War I, I, I don't think, I was aware, uh, and I know most people I talked to were not aware, and I'm talking about educated people, that uh, America erupted in these race riots across the country in 1917, 1918, 1919, and, and 1919 was known as the Red Summer of 1919. The Chicago race riot was the worst of, uh, of many that took place that summer. What made the riot different is that it was the first and probably the deadliest of two dozen riots that took place in uh, the World War I period. And uh, it was the first one, it was the, the, probably the deadliest one, and it sort of set the pattern for those that followed. Uh, whites would attack blacks, uh, accuse them of taking their jobs. Uh, in some cases, uh, white industrialists were in part guilty for flooding the market with blacks. They were advertising in southern newspapers of job help wanted and when there were no jobs at all so that they, so that they would have a large pool of workers to draw from to defeat them, so the unions could not organize against them. Uh, and I, I, but I think it was the first and it set the pattern. And it was followed by uh, what I considered to be uh, the first major civil rights demonstration. Uh, there was a march two weeks after the riot, uh, in mid-July of 1917. There was ten to eight, eight to 10,000 people uh, marched down Fifth Avenue from Harlem to time to uh, the middle of the town, the middle of New York. Uh, to protest the East St. Louis race riot and to protest racism across America. But the East St. Louis race riot was the spark for the first civil rights march. I think what I want a reader to take away from the book is that it ain't over. And I just think that uh, we need to be conscious, that, very conscious and not forget uh, that this was our racial history and it all grew out of slavery. Uh, it was a deadly legacy of slavery. Uh, and we still see its results around us.